these are on. Good evening. Good evening. Nice to see everybody on such a warm, summery evening. My name is John Henry, and it's a pleasure to welcome you to the FIA and to tonight's presentation by Dr. Justin Sledge, who will present part one of Real Books of Magic. Next week, on the 22nd, he will be back to deliver part two. The Sheppy Dog Fund Lecture Series was established in 2012 by Dr. Alan Klein to address the topics of art, religion, and history prior to the 19th century. And I'd like to thank Alan Klein for his continued sponsorship of this wonderful series. It's Before I bring up Dr. Sledge to the stage, I'd like to thank the citizens of Genesee County for the Genesee County Arts, Education, and Cultural Enrichment Millage, which provides free entry to all citizens of Genesee County every day of the week. Now, before I go any further, will you join me in silencing these noise-making devices? Dr. Sledge was born in Jackson, Mississippi. I think so, too. <laughs> I used to live there, and wow's the right word. He received a master's degree in mysticism and esoteric philosophy from the University of Amsterdam and a master's and PhD in philosophy from the University of Memphis. He has written on the intersection of metaphysics and politics, often focusing on non-canon figures in the Western intellectual tradition. Dr. Sledge currently teaches philosophy and religion, religious studies at Wayne State University. Let's welcome once again, Dr. Justin Sledge. <laughs> Justin, how many appearances does this make? I think five. Five. I think five, yeah. It's been... and, and as you see, we can't get enough. <laughs> So I'm, glad you're here. I'm so glad to be back. Thank you. All right, let me turn this off. Thank you. Also, just I think it's fine. Also, just before I get started, I just want to say a um, a deep sense of gratitude and thank you for all the folks who've come out on this warm evening, but also for the staff and the folks at the FIA who have really shepherded this institution through um, through the ongoing pandemic and who continue to provide such enormous cultural resources for the community. So thank you folks here at the FBI. Yeah. I will, yeah. All right, folks, good evening. Good evening. So tonight we're going to focus a bit on books of magic, books of magic. There are lots of magical artifacts from history. So we could talk about curse tablets, deficiones, often made of lead in, uh, in the Roman period. But I think what most of us imagine the magician or sorcerer or necromancer, God forbid, we imagine them with the great tome of magic, the book of magic, right? If you've ever played Dungeons and Dragons or Harry Potter or what have you, right? It's the book of magic that I think many of us have in mind when we imagine the magician. And you may be surprised to learn that a great many books of magic survive from antiquity all the way to contemporary times. Now, the filter of history, what I call the filter of history, is a cruel, cruel thing. History is not kind to anything. Most of us will not make it through history. History will make sure that we are long forgotten. I sometimes create a great deal of comfort in that myself. But history is especially cruel to books. Books are very fragile items. I imagine that many of you have books in your home that are on their last leg. I have books that may, hardly made it a semester with me, and they are now on their last leg. Books of magic 
are especially vulnerable to the vicissitudes of history, to the harm of history, the filter of history. And if you want an image that really captures that, take a look at the one on the left. That is an image of books being burned in the Middle Ages. Many, many books were banned and burned throughout history. And many of the kinds of books that were going to be targeted for being banned and burned, as you might imagine, will be books of magic. Because books of magic are inherently threatening to a great deal many people. So what we would be surprised, I think, to learn is that a great deal of these books do survive. Many, many more than you might think. I think when many of us conjure up the idea of the Middle Ages, we just imagine the Inquisition burning books as some kind of proto-Nazis or something like that, God forbid, right? But surprisingly, a great deal of these books do survive from antiquity through the Middle Ages down till now. And what I'm going to do in the next couple of lectures tonight and a week from tonight, I'm going to take you on a guided tour of some of the books that have survived, some of the books of magic that have survived, all the way back from Roman Alexandria. Now, as you probably imagine, every civilization that has created writing has created books of magic. Every civilization. Here on the left, you'll have a cuneiform tablet. This is the Maklu ritual. This is a ritual, an anti-witchcraft ritual, right? I don't like the term witchcraft here because I don't like how uh, it's, witchcraft is painted in a negative light in some of the literature here. But this is an anti-evil magic ritual performed typically in this time of the year in ancient Babylon. And this was a ritual called the burning ritual in which a, uh, a person would be ritually summoning various gods in order to harm those who harmed them with evil magic. So this is a copy of the Maklu ritual preserved from ancient Babylon. Now, just as many cultures had magic, they also prohibited magic. Because I don't know about you, I want to be the person in control of things. I don't want to be the person being the victim of the people controlling things. I don't want, I'd much rather be, I mean, ask yourself, do you want to be on team being cursed? Or do you want to be on team doing the cursing? You know what side of the equation you want to be on. So many cultures had magic and many cultures passed legislation banning various kinds of magic. That's even true, for instance, in the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, where we have very clear examples of something like magic, various forms of divination that are allowed by the Hebrew Bible, and then many kinds of divination and magic that are disallowed by the Hebrew Bible. One of the really interesting things about the Hebrew Bible in the Old Testament is that the various early attestation of something from the Hebrew Bible, the earliest quote, the earliest piece of the Bible ever recovered was ironically a piece of magic. On the right, you see an image of an amulet recovered from Ketef Hinnom. These are tombs outside of, well, really inside of Jerusalem. These tiny little silver amulets contain the priestly benediction. May the Lord look upon you and shine upon you and give you peace, etc., right? That's the earliest pieces of the Hebrew Bible ever recovered, hundreds of years earlier than Dead Sea Scrolls. These silver amulets were rolled up and put into tombs in Jerusalem, probably to protect the dead from evil spirits. The very text that banned magic is only known in its earliest attestation as an object of magic. Now, I'm pretty sure those people are rolling in their graves, right? But again, any culture that prohibits it, the prohibition is evidence that was being practiced because prohibition indicates practice. Here again, the oldest sections of the Hebrew Bible preserved on magical amulets. But that's not quite where we need to start. If we want to talk about the history of magic, at least in the Western world, at least in terms of books, well, unsurprisingly, we're going to go to the place that had the biggest library in the ancient world. That's Alexandria. Alexandria, as you may know, was founded by Alexander the Great because he's not a megalomaniac or anything. It's not like he founded 30 cities named after him or anything, right? So what we have in Alexandria there in Upper Egypt is, or yeah, there in uh, right on the Nile Delta is one of the most impressive cities of the ancient world designed to be a melting pot. A third of the population of Alexandria were Jewish people. Another third were pagans. Another third were various kinds of indigenous Egyptian people. It was kind of like the New York City of the ancient world. It was a huge melting pot. And into that massive melting pot, especially in the Roman period, we began to have these various cultures mixing together. 
pagans and Jews and early Christians beginning to mix things together to develop various kinds of religious technology. Now, as you might imagine, there is the official religious technology, which is things like prayer. So your bishop or your rabbi would say, if you want access to God, come to the synagogue, come to the temple, come to the church and pray, and then God will sort you out. Well, that's the official line. Now, how many people here know the official line? And they also know that takes forever and sometimes doesn't work. So what do you do? You just skirt over HR and go directly to the manager. If your God isn't answering your prayers, well, get a new God. Pick another God. You have to imagine that ancient peoples had a lot bigger menu of divinities, of gods, than most of us do. Most people raised in a sort of vaguely Christian or vaguely Jewish world have the the one God. And if your one God doesn't answer your prayers, you may not have a lot of options. In ancient Alexandria, you cross the street, right? Like, you know, whatever. Jesus isn't answering your prayers, I'll try, I'll try the Old Testament God. The Old Testament God's, how about Hermes Trismegistus? Pick a God, any God. What we got in the ancient Alexandrian context is a world of enormous religious syncretism. Lots of religions being blended together and lots of religious technologies that aren't exactly orthodox. And it's here, not only do we have a lot of unorthodox religious technologies, but we have the very things we would need to begin to do the work of writing, right? That cuneiform tablet, you want to carry that around with you to protect yourself from evil spirits? Weighs like 10 pounds, wear that around your neck? No, right? That's not going to work. But ancient Alexandria is right there on the Nile, full of papyrus, the origin of a word for paper. And as you can imagine, it's a lot cheaper to write on papyrus with ink. You can roll that up and you can carry it around and it's inexpensive and relatively durable. We have not just the religious technology, we have the literary technology. And it's there in Egypt, unsurprisingly, that those two technologies are going to come together and we're going to begin to see the rapid dissemination of books of magic. It's the right place at the right time with the right kind of cultural attitudes, and it's there that we begin to see the forms of magic that will survive into today. When I say today, many, we'll see this as we march along through this, uh, these corporal of lectures, many of the magical symbols and magical spells developed in ancient Alexandria 1,700 years ago, 1,800 years ago, are still being used now. You can see magical symbols, and we'll see them. We'll see magical symbols developed almost 2,000 years ago still being used by practitioners of magic to this day. There is an enormous amount of cultural continuity when it comes to the practice of magic, which is incredible considering how persecuted the practice of magic has been in history. Further, ancient Alexandria is not only home to the writing and the intellectual and religious culture, it's also open to a combination of two very, very important things when it comes to technology. We call these the occult sciences. Now, I know the word occult scares some folks, right? Because if you you imagine the word occult, and it instantly summons up the satanic panic of the 80s, and God knows, right? Just hear the word occult, it just means hidden. It just means the forces in reality that are not apparent to your sight. You live in a world of occult forces. Gravity is an occult force. It's acting on you right now. You don't see it right? I'm pretty sure I'd jump down here, you would see it, but I'm not going to do that. Uh, But occult just means hidden. And what we have in ancient Alexandria are two major occult sciences that undergo massive, massive development. The first is astrology, which is to say the study of the influence of the stars and the heavenly bodies onto our planet. And so it's there in Alexandria that we have people like Ptolemy developing astrology as we know it. And again, at this time, there's no difference really between astrology and astronomy. And they are at this point beginning to understand the nature of, for instance, the tides. And again, we now think of astrology perhaps as a bit of a pseudoscience, but you have to understand that at that time, they could notice that the moon was doing this and the tides did this. They're looking out on the Bay of Alexandria. They're like, why does this effect happen? And if it happens with the moon, it must happen with other stars and planets as well. So astrology undergoes massive systematization under people like Ptolemy and the Almagest in Alexandria. Secondly, we have the development of what is now called alchemy. Folks and folks may have been here when I gave a lecture here on alchemy. Alchemy also was developed primarily in ancient Alexandria. This work here is called the Chrysopoeia of 
Cleopatra. That's not Cleopatra the seventh, the Cleopatra you're probably thinking of, famous Cleopatra. Uh, this is a different Cleopatra, a more anonymous Cleopatra, but one of the early alchemists was a woman. Actually, several of them were actually women. And what we have here is a range of alchemical preparations for how to produce gold. This coded message here at the bottom is called the formula of the crab. It is our earliest example of an attempt to show in notation how one makes gold. Now, we're not sure that they're talking about making gold as in making lead into gold or tinting metals into gold, but these are some of the earliest symbols that we have. We can't quite read them. No one's quite sure what they mean, but these are the earliest attempts at something like chemical notation. So here we have an attempt to probe deeply into nature to transform nature, right? So we're looking very deep into the nature of nature. In astrology, we're looking up into the heavens. You can imagine this is the melting pot in which magic is going to do very, very well. We have astrology, alchemy, we have the writing utensils, we have the religious technology, we have the, melt, the melting pot of pagans and Jews and Christians and other kinds of people. Here, magic, as we know it in the Western world, really will get on its feet. How do we know that? Thousands of these texts survive. Thousands. We know of at least 120 distinct magical texts to survive from Roman Alexandria. I want you to let that settle in for a moment. 120 distinct texts of magic survive from Roman Alexandria. Now, do some math. How many texts do you think have been lost in the past 2,000 years? From 2,000 years ago. If 120 have survived... You can imagine that what must have existed at that time were thousands, tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands, millions. These survive all over the world in various collections, including at the University of Michigan. The University of Michigan has one of the largest collections of Roman-era Alexandrian magical papyri in the country. The largest text that we have that survives from Alexandria is what is called the Great Magical Papyrus. It survives in Paris, and these all survive as one collection called the Greek Magical Papyri. These collection of Greek magical papyri, there are enormous amounts of them. Um, we have almost every form of magic that you can imagine. So we have erotic binding spells, sometimes called love magic. I don't like to call it love magic because if I make you fall in love with me, you don't really have consent in that. And typically when we take consent at, it's not really love. It's something worse, horrible, um, but it's love magic. Right? We have all kinds of things, including things from cursing business people. So if you don't like your business partner, you can curse them because who hasn't cursed their boss? Um, so you have all kinds of things, cursing things. We have uh, religious liturgies that survived. In fact, the Mithras cult, if folks have ever heard of the cult of Mithraism, the only religious ritual of Mithraism to survive survives in the Greek magical papyri. That's it. We have the one ritual that survives in this collection. We have dozens of kinds of amulets for exorcisms, for cures. We have exorcisms. Uh, we have spells for getting bugs out of your house. Apparently, goat bile is good for that, just <laughs> if you have goat bile around. Um, uh, I'm not kidding. It really is goat bile. Um, we have an enormous amount of protective amulets. We have, uh, we have amulets to allow for rapid learning. We have all kinds of magical spells that have survived from ancient Alexandria. These are just a couple of uh, examples of what these texts look like and how they are preserved. They're preserved really, really well, all things considered. If you want an example of a spell, I'm sure all of us would like to turn invisible sometime, especially my introverts. Where are my introverts at? Um, yeah, introverts are like, yeah, I'd like to be invisible all the time. This is a spell, and in, uh, this is also just FYI, it says it's an indispensable spell for invisibility. This is translated from the ancient Greek. Now, I'm not going to read the whole thing to you. You can read it as I'm talking. Uh, good luck finding this stuff. Um, but this is a spell for, inv for invisibility. Um, now, you may be wondering, but here we have, right, we say it to Helios. That is the sun god. I adjure you by your great name. And then we get this long string of what appears to us to be gibberish. These are called barbarous words. The idea in ancient magic and in modern magic, and this is why you've, if you've ever seen magical spells, sometimes they're in Latin or Hebrew for some reason, why wouldn't they just work in English? There's something about the idea of the, an ancient language or an unknown language having more power. 
And that's also true in the Greek magical papyri, where we have these strange names. Now, most of these names are relatively incomprehensible, with some exceptions. We know this name, Iota Alpha Omega. This is the name for the Hebrew god. This is the Greek version of yod Hey vav Hey, Yahweh, Jehovah. Now, you might be asking yourself, what in the world are they praying to Helios for, the sun god, the pagan sun god, but also including the Israelite Jewish god in their incantation? The answer is syncretism. The answer is, do you really want to bet on one god? How many horses do you bet on? You hedge your bets. You hedge your bets at the horse race. You hedge your bets in the stock market. You hedge your bets when you like, yeah, you know, whatever. You hedge your bets with your gods. So this is an example of where they are hedging their bets with their gods. But we also have all these other unusual words. Some of these we've deciphered and some of them we haven't. Many of them are probably not decipherable because they were never sensible to begin with. All right, another example here, right? This one's even interesting in a different way, right? Again, you can see some great spells here. These are astrological symbols, by the way. Uh, some really early ones. They're not the ones you probably recognize. Those don't come along into the Byzantine period. I, I adjure you, Evangelos, right? That is a gospel writer. We, from that, right, we know that when the writer of this is adjuring the person by an, by an evangel, by a gospel writer, we know the identity of this person immediately. They are a Christian. They're a Christian, right? And then things get weird, right? And also by Anubis and Hermes. Anubis is an Egyptian god, specifically the, one of the Egyptian gods of the dead, the embalming god, right? So, right? And also Hermes, the Greek god, right? So again, I don't know how to, in the first line of this thing, we're already getting some cool magical technology in terms of, of uh, I don't know, syncretism. So we get this thing, right, and it goes down. We get various kinds of attracting and binding spells. This is a bi erotic binding spell. Notice the people getting bound to each other here, right? Uh, and all the rest down below, you summon them by the infernal gods. So this is black magic, as we might call it, right? These are summoning them with gods, chthonic gods. Attract and bind Serapis whom Helen bore to this Heraeus. Serapius and Heraeus are both women's names. This is one of the rare, the only example that we know of, of a queer binding spell from antiquity. This is a woman binding another woman to them in love. This is our only example, right? We have some male male, we have one female female, and a whole bunch of male female. We have virtually none female male, right? Because it just doesn't work like that. But here we have an example of a binding spell between two women tune to women. So I think a really fascinating example, right, of a magical spell, an erotic binding spell, in which basically we have a woman trying to bind another woman to her in love. Again, we have more of these elaborate uh, names um, there at the bottom as well. I really like these spells. And you can see the PGM just stands for Greek Magical Papyri. This is collection 32 lines 1 through 19. You can buy these. If you come next week, I'll have a reading list for you of every single book that I'll be going through. So another reading to, reason to come back next week. Not only, right, and just, uh, just FYI, I want to make sure that folks see these. And I'm not sure how well you can see these in the images here, right? But if you see these little lines, these little, these little lines here with the little dots at the end, I don't know how well you can see them. Um, Let's see if I can find another one, a little clear image. Um, yeah, here's some actually from this alchemical manuscript. See these little dots with the lines attached to them? Keep an eye on those. You'll see them again and again and again. There's some here, right? You can see some of them on this manuscript. It's a little difficult to see because it's a papyrus. Um, maybe some there on this uh, astrological manuscript. But here also, of course, if it's not just the Alexandrine Folks there, it's also the Jews. The Jews are also engaging in magic as well. Now, I know what you're probably thinking. Doesn't the Bible say that you're not supposed to do magic? Sure. The Bible says a lot of things, right? The Bible says a lot of things. And I, you, again, you can bet your money that the moment they went to the rabbi and the rabbi said, yeah, pray on it, and it didn't work, well, they went next door to the magician. Again, most of us, most of us, I think many of us, there's what we're supposed to do, and there's what we do do. And religion doesn't study what we're supposed to do. It studies what we do do. It studies what they did. 
And one of the great books we have that has been recovered from the ancient world is a book of early Jewish magic called the Sefer HaRazim, the Book of Secrets. Uh, it makes it sound much more cool when you call it the Book of Secrets, but that's what they called it. Which is weird because now it's like on a slide in a very public room with you know 100 people here. But be careful what you publish. Your secrets won't be safe long. This text was recovered from the Cairo Geniza. A Geniza is just a place where you store manuscripts, uh, Jewish manuscripts, before that you bury them. And this was recovered in the 19th century, and it is a system of angel magic. Now, angel magic is interesting because it skirts the line. Now, if you're an Orthodox Jew, can you pray to Anubis? Eww, probably not, right? You're probably going to get in trouble with your local rabbi, right? You know, like, that's not a thing. But pick a guy just below Anubis. How about Michael the Archangel? How about Gabriel? They're still in your, like, game, right? They're still in your word game. Like, yeah, I, can, like, I can't deal with Anubis. He's not in my game, right? But I can deal with Michael. I can deal with Gabriel, Uriel. So what happens is that often these groups will say, yeah, I'm not doing magic because I'm not asking Anubis to do something. I'm asking Gabriel to do something. It just kind of switched the guy over, right? You could like, yeah, we got our own guy for that. It's Gabriel. You guys use Anubis, we use Gabriel, right? And what we have is a system of angel magic arranged in tiered heavens, right? The seventh heaven, the third heaven, the fourth heaven. And what you do in this form of magic is you invoke those angels. Basically, you call them. I'm not kidding. You have magical passwords to access them. You're looking at one down there at the bottom. That is a magical password to access an ancient angel. Once you give that angel the ancient password, the magical password, they are at that point commanded basically to do your bidding. They're kind of bound over to you. Now, what are they bound over you to do? Well, the kinds of things that people do when they do magic, things like winning horse races. I'm not kidding. That was, you could call the angel Gabriel, and of all the things you would ask the angel Gabriel to do, you would ask the angel Gabriel to help you win a horse race. Now, I know that sounds silly, but put yourself in back, in, back in ancient Rome. You know how much money won on ancient horse races? The largest riot in human history was because of horse races. The Nike riots in Byzantium under the reign of Justinian were so bad, 40,000 people were killed in the riots. It destabilized the empire so badly that Belisarius had to be recalled from the conquest of Italy to put down a sports riot. So when you hear horse race, we think the horse race. They were a big deal in ancient Rome. Also, by the way, this tells us when this was written because the horse races weren't racing in the 6th and 7th century. They were racing in the 4th and 3rd. So we have a good idea of when this Jewish book of magic was written down. You don't bet on stuff that no one's doing anymore. We have all kinds of things. Horse races, more gaining love, right? Uh, healing and cursing. Also finding buried treasure. One of the things you'll hear about a lot for the next now and next week is people who are interested in magic were also very interested in finding buried treasure. Almost every book of magic has at least one spell for finding buried treasure because who doesn't like the Goonies? Um, it's all about so much of this stuff. So this text is a how to summon angels in order to get your will, get your way. This book survives in really great shape. You can buy a copy of it and, I don't know, get the angel Gabriel to help you with your horse races. Or whatever, Powerball. If you win at Powerball because you bought this book, you remember me. <laughs> you need to look me up, email me, and be like, here's, a th here's $11 billion. The Christians got in this too, folks. Don't think that the Christians, right? Again, we all like to think, oh, our team doesn't do magic. We do religion. My team doesn't, is not up to all those shenanigans. Every team is up to shenanigans because every team is trying to win at life, right? And we have examples, extensive examples of early Christian magic from this time period as well. These are depictions of more angels. It's all about the angels for the Christians and the Jews, right? Because they have access to this angelic hierarchies. And so we here we have examples of, again, text written in Coptic. This is a magical text. It's using to summon angels. And we get a lot of interesting things here with dealing with, for instance, demons. Now, in the Bible, it seems to be relatively clear that if you want to exercise a demon, you just say, in Jesus' name, come out of there. And you're like one and done. Jesus makes it look easy, right? Well, if you understand in the ancient world, most theories of illness were wrapped up with demon possession. Right? If I were to fall now, fall down right now, God forbid, and begin to shake, God forbid, right, you would have a pretty good idea that I was having perhaps an epileptic seizure. In the first century, you'd be like, no, he's not having an epileptic seizure, he's possessed by a demon. 
right? This is the idea. You have, you have fever demons. You have all kinds of demons out there that cause illness. Now, if you're a doctor, and there were schools of medicine that existed at this time, people like Galen and Hippocrates, but guess what? Go to a Roman doctor, they're as likely to kill you as cure you, right? You're like, oh, you have a fever? Let me cut your arm open and bleed you some. That'll fix you, right? Blood is hot. You're hot. You want to get less hot? Yeah. By the way, we laugh at that. Benjamin, you know, George Washington died from that. George Washington was bled to death because he had basically pneumonia. He's running a fever. His doctor giving him the best health care you could get in 1700s America, which is about as good as it is now, right? They, they bled him to death. So again, Galenic medicine, Hippocratic medicine, we laugh at it, but it was still being practiced up to the late 18th century uh, in many places like the backwaters of North America with George Washington. If bleeding them didn't work, what might you do? You might turn to not bleeding them and not praying. You might turn to magical technology. This is an example of a clearly Christian, right? We had Jesus mentioned here, right? Holy Spirit and the Father. We have all of the things who's below the seven. Those are the seven planets, uh, including the sun and the moon, which they thought were planets, which they thought were stars. It's complicated. At any rate, we have all of these things right, and we have various kinds of names. Yao Sabaoth. We've already seen Yao before, right? That I-A-O name already in the Jewish amulet here being transferred over to a Christian amulet. And we have all the things we have for driving out this demon. Uh, and it's a demon, whoever you are. It's great. It's so generic. <laughs> Um, and we have some of these magical names here written out at the bottom as well. Um, yeah, and throws them into black perdition with adamantine fetters. It's pretty, this is a pretty common, pretty ritualistic thing. By the way, some of these uh, incantations we find, we see that they are written out on metal, and the, the, the letter N there is the space for their name. It's just left blank, and so the uh, magical person who's selling this stuff could just write their name in in sort of like an assembly line. Uh, magicians are there to make money as well. It's not like they're sort of, you know, doing out of goodness of their heart, you went to the guy and he's going to charge you. Um, we have good examples of uh, whole amulets being produced in mass and kind of uh, amulet workshops back in the late classical world. Uh, and you just fill your name in and send you on your way. Some of them were badly misspelled. Some of them were actually gibberish. The person that made them couldn't even read and they were selling them to other people that couldn't even read. Um, yeah, we have lots of examples of that from antiquity. Um, yeah, make sure you read your amulet. Um, you know, who knows what you're going to get? Um, this is a great example of a Christian amulet uh, produced here. Um, this is how you drive out the demon. This is the procedure. The first part was just the incantation. That's the part you say out loud. This is the actual procedure, right? You take some olive branches and tie them together, and then you uh, kind of ritually beat the person to beat the demon out of them. And again, we have a whole bunch more magical words um, there again. Um, this image is a classic image of a uh, Christian amulet. We have literally Jesus on the amulet. Um, and then we have a lot of these little ringlet shapes over and over and over again. Um, these eventually become the language of the angels, as we'll see as, we do, as they go on. And this form of magic with these little ringlet shapes, this is dating back to about the ninth century. You'll see this all the way into contemporary books of witchcraft. In fact, uh, contemporary books of witchcraft will still have an, a an alphabet called Malachim, the angel writing or passing the river. It's the exact same script. Right? With some modifications, it survived over cultural continuity for now uh, over a couple hundred, 1,500 years or so. Um, again, more angels. You see these two guys here at the bottom. These are the other crucified uh, people, the two thieves crucified with, um, with Jesus, um, with their names above them. And again, you have more magical incantations. Another great example of a Christian book of magic dating from this time period is what is called the Testament of Solomon. Testament of Solomon, as you probably know, Solomon was the son of David. He was one of the kings of Israel, and he was also famous for using demons to construct the temple. Now, you may be asking yourself, where in the Bible does it say that Solomon used demons to build the temple? It don't. <laughs> That's other stuff that got left out of the Bible for reasons that are obvious, <laughs> um, that got left out of the Bible, but didn't get left out of everything. These books survive, and the Testament of Solomon is one example where we have a demonological list, that is to say a list of demons, and all the demons that Solomon used to build the temple, everything from spinning rope to carrying water to cutting blocks and things like that. In this literature, Solomon is described as his ability to control demons. Now, I don't know about you, but if I can hire someone to like clean my study, which as the books I have produce a lot of dust, if I could have someone vacuum my floors, I'd do that. 
for free, if I could get a demon to do that for me, I would probably do that, as long as they, you know, not too much of a hassle. We have enormous lists. The Testament of Solomon contains a list of over 80 different demons that Solomon bound using other angels to help him construct the temple. This ring, this image you see here, is what is called the Solomonic seal. This is the earliest example of a Solomonic seal. This allegedly is the symbol used by Solomon to bind those demons. If Solomon can do it, and he was like a lecherous apostate, to put it nicely, uh, you can do it. (laughs) And so if Solomon, the lecherous apostate, can do it, you can too. And guess what? This form of magic, Solomonic magic, began to be practiced sometime in the early centuries of the Common Era and is still practiced all the way through the Middle Ages and is still practiced now. The Lesser Key of Solomon is probably the most famous book of magic in the Western world at this point, and it goes back to the 3rd and 4th centuries in probably Judea, Roman Palestine. The Testament of Solomon is the example, again, of Christian magic. If you're, if you're wondering what this word around the inside of the circle means, no one knows. Uh, probably a divine name, maybe encoded, we don't know. But this is an example of the seal of Solomon from a 15th century Greek manuscript. But uh, if you want to get a demon to drive you around, there's the, that's the seal you use, I guess. Um, other forms of magic also survive. Again, going back to angel magic. Another form of magic we have that has survived is a book called the Sar Torah. How many folks here like to study? Some folks do, right? I read books all the time. If I could just have the knowledge. How many people here have done that prayer right before your calculus test where you're like, dear God? <laughs> I know I haven't been a good guy. I haven't been a good ex, insert your ex, right? But if you help me out with this calculus test, I will like Hail Mary and Shema Yisrael and all the things. Many of us have made those prayers, right? Well, imagine not having to study ever again. You just have an angel come and input the knowledge into your head. The magical form in the Jewish world, the earliest attestation we have, this is called the Sar Torah literature. This is a form of magic in which you summon an angel, more angel summoning, called the Prince of the Torah, and that angel comes down and inputs directly into your mind all of rabbinical wisdom. Now, I've studied in Orthodox yeshivas. I've spent eight hours a day studying things in Aramaic. I don't want to do that ever again. <laughs> I like to do it as a hobby. It's okay. But as a lifestyle, it's tiring. Imagine just being done with that. And you can go on and like do something else, learn assembly code. I don't know, right? This is an example of a form of magic where you summon an angel. The angel comes down and the mag- puts the knowledge into your head. Now, you're probably asking, does this stuff work? I have no idea. Um, but the book of the Sar Torah does exist. The incantations still exist. And if you read Hebrew, you can give it your best shot. Um, this form of magic where you rapidly learn knowledge is going to be transferred from ancient Jewish magic into ancient Christian magic. Because again, Christians and Jews, not always the best relationship. But at the end of the day, if you've got some magical technology and it kind of works for everybody, I'm going to take it from you. Like intellectual property be damned. We're going like, to get your magical technology. This form of magic will be imported into the Christian world in a form of magic called the Ars Notoria that we'll get to next week. This is a way in which if you stare at angelic images, you can just learn philosophy and rhetoric and math and all the things. Yes, we'll get to that next week. The Ars Notoria is the oldest form of indigenous European magic, and it's still kind of practiced all the way up till this day. Although it takes like four months and it seems like kind of a schlep, but I guess it's still better than studying in a medieval university. They could still beat you back then for being bad. Um, They could still do that 10 years ago, probably. Um, At any rate, these are going to be important forms of magic here in the early Jewish world, eventually imported into the early Christian world. Another very important form of magic is a text called the Sefer Yetzirah, the Book of Formation. How many folks here have ever heard of a golem? The golem. This is an, an entity made out of clay that uh, you make it out of clay and then you bring it to life. You bring it to life with this book, right? This is the shortest, strangest book in all of Judaism, which is saying a lot because Jews don't tend to write short books, but strange, a lot of those. But this is the shortest and the strangest. 
It's only about 2,200 words in its normal redaction, but this is the book by which one can bring to life artificial life. Not only that, the Talmud says that by this book, you can bring to, you can bring to life artificial animals, and if you're really righteous, you can even create worlds. Worlds, just like God did. So this book makes one, perhaps one of the most audacious claims in all of magical history. It says, if you're really righteous, you can make life. You can make life, you can make worlds. And so Sefer Yetzirah is a book that is going to go on to become the foundation of what we call Kabbalah, Jewish mysticism. If you've ever heard the ritual idea, abracadabra, that's Aramaic, right? It means I create as I speak. That is what it means. It takes a little, you have to kind of look at it sideways and pronounce it wrong, but that's what it means. Um, magical stuff doesn't always get preserved very well. But the idea that creation happens through speech is perfectly biblical. Guess how God created this world, allegedly? Through speech. Yehi or, let there be light. And, yehi or, there was light. God created through speech. And, if God does it through God's righteousness, say for Yetzer argues, you could do it too if you're righteous enough as well. You can create people, calves. In fact, in the Talmud, they make a third grown calf, sacrifice and eat it for the Sabbath. They, they eat the golem cow. So these, this text is going to go on to become enormously important in Jewish magic. It will become enormously important in Kabbalah. It will also become norm- enormously important in magic in general. If you've ever read a Harry Potter novel, how does he do the magic? How does everyone do the magic? They speak, and it follows. That idea that speech creates reality has its origin here in the book Sefer Yetzirah, the book of formation. Again, an early book of Jewish magic, probably written sometime in the 8th century. And again, you might think to yourself, didn't both the rabbis not be okay with this? Wouldn't like the local rabbis not be okay? No. The earliest commentaries we have in this book are by rabbis, and not just rabbis, the most influential rabbis of the day. This was relatively mainstream in the rabbinical world. So it wasn't something that was sort of in the shadows. This book, you can go into an Orthodox Jewish bookstore and buy it right now and make a golem if you want, I guess. Um, Be careful you make a golem, because then you're like, what am I going to do with the golem after that? Um, Like, yeah, you have to figure out, you shouldn't just do it. Uh, It's not a great idea. Of course, Islam comes on the scene in the 7th century, where Prophet Muhammad uh, makes his uh, his immigration immigration to 622, and by 632 he is is dead, and Islam is well on its way to uh, cultural and religious supremacy in the region. Now, the Muslims are going to tell you, gladly will tell you, we don't do magic, because that's haram, that's forbidden, the Quran forbids it. And people will happily say, yeah, we do whatever we do. Your book can say whatever, your rules can say whatever, and people are going to do what they're going to do. Magic is going to be one of the things they're going to do. In fact, the early Muslims, we can thank in many ways for being the great systematizers of magic. They inherit all of the knowledge from the ancient Greek world. In fact, in many ways, they keep the lights on. Um, Not only that, while Europe was in the Dark Ages, the Muslim world was going through its Golden Age, they inherit, systematize, and create all kinds of new works. It's very important to note that the Muslim cultures were not just carriers of culture, they were also inventors of culture as well. And one of the things they're going to develop is going to be magical technologies as well. They will systematize them. Whereas in earlier magical books, we have just spells. Do this. And if it didn't work, by the way, also you can imagine why the spell is so complicated. Because when it didn't work, you would go back to the guy that sold it to you and be like, it didn't work. You're like, you didn't do it right. Did you pronounce that divine name right? It's like, it has 60 letters. Now you got to work on it, right? There's always like a fail safe for when it doesn't work. You're like, I don't know. Did you use bat's blood? You're like, yeah. Oh, you need pigeon's blood um, or something, right? You pick some weird, you need a hoot owl. Where does it come from? I don't know, Russia. Um, you can always find a way around making it work. Um, it's here in the Islamic world that they're going to heavily systematize magic. And the really important person in the history of that, one of the really important people in the history of that is going to be Al-Kindi. Al-Kindi is one of the greatest mathematical geniuses of all time. He invents, uh, oh God, what is the stuff he invents? He invents one of the most important ways of doing cryptoanalysis. He does uh, frequency cryptoanalysis. He discovers how to break codes using uh, frequency analysis. He discovers that. He's a great mathematician. He also systematizes the ideas of what he calls the stellar rays. Al-Kindi argues that the heavenly objects irradiate, how to call it, divine forms. And those divine forms, as they radiate down to Earth, get reflected and refracted by other planets. 
And the task of the magician is to understand that system of reflection and refraction. And as you understand it, you can manipulate it. And how do you manipulate it? You manipulate it through speech. You manipulate it through talismans. The word talisman comes from Arabic. And you manipulate it through sacrifices. You sacrifice animals and maybe people, and you can heavily influence the radiation, the stellar rays, through this process. If you've ever held a talisman or seen a talisman, you can think Alkendi. His theory is that certain symbols have power, and those certain symbols capture that radiation coming down from the stars, and because they capture that radiation, right? If you're gonna capture, for instance, Martian radiation, the radiation coming down from Mars, that's really good if you want to engage in combat because that energy, that radiation, is martial in character and will enable you to engage in combat more sophisticatedly. So here he combines an enormous amount of astronomy, astrology, alchemy, and magic into a great system. In fact, when his works were reprinted in Europe, they don't survive in Arabic, unfortunately, but when they were reprinted in uh, Europe, they're simply called Theorica Artium Magicarum, the theory of the magic arts. This was the going theory for magic for all of European and Islamic history. It has to do with stellar radiation. If you've ever had the idea, I mean, up to this day, right, if I say, what planet or what object, stellar object, is associated with silver? Any guesses? The moon. It's the moon. Yeah, the moon, right? Copper. You would think of sun, Venus. Yeah, this is like those ideas that there are metals attached to the various planets, right? Those ideas are, uh, are gemstones attached to various planets. That idea comes ultimately from Al-Kindi. Um, and that idea is still around. I mean, you still hear people talk about things like, oh, I'm in, Sat I'm in, I'm in Mercury retrograde, or I'm, you know, it's the return of my Saturn, right? Those ideas that, oh yeah, this is having influence on us via various, various kinds of things. Those astrological ideas are coming principally from Al-Kindi. Um, of course, Jewish people continue to write magic as well. Uh, one of my favorite texts, uh, this will show my age. Have you ever hacked into a video game with like a game genie or used a cheat code in a video game? Well, here's a cheat code for reality itself. <laughs> it's called the Harba de Moshe. This is Aramaic for the Sword of Moses. What you get is a two-part book. One part of the book is a code book. It's just a long string of Aramaic and Hebrew letters, right? So this is what you're looking at here. This is the beginning of the long string of Hebrew and Aramaic characters. They don't mean anything. Sometimes they're just rep repetitions of ya, 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 over and over again. Um, that's one of the lines you can see there. But what you do is you take a section out of that, and then you use a spell from the later half of the book, and then this becomes the incantation by which you use that incantation to accomplish the spell. I've highlighted a section there for curing migraines. This is to destroy a demon called Palga. Palga in Aramaic means to split. And it's, if you've ever had a splitting headache, Palga is a demon responsible, just so you know. And if you want to get rid of Palga, this would be the incantation that you would use along with a spell from the Charba de Moshe, from the book of, uh, from the sword of Moses. We also have astrological magic and astronomical magic that's preserved in a book called Sefer Hayashar, another book of astrological Jewish magic. And we have a magical cloak that one can make in a uh, document called the Sefer Haumabush, the book of the cloak, book of the garment. This is a magical cloak that summons angels to beat up people for you, basically. <laughs> like, my dad can beat up your dad. And like, my dad's got a bunch of angels to help me out. Um, and so the Sefer HaMalbush, it doesn't make you invisible, which you would really hope that a magic cloak would do of all things, it would make you invisible. It doesn't, it just summons a bunch of angels to beat up people for you. Um, and so um, there's other powers too, you can set people on fire and things like that, which is also very convenient. Um, so this uh, Sefer, uh, this mantle of righteousness is a kind of ma a magical cloak that survives from a magical book here called the Sefer HaMalbush. These two, Sefer Hayashar and Sefer HaMalbush, are still being reprinted to this day in the ultra-Orthodox ultra, ultra Jewish world. I don't know how many of those guys are making these magical cloaks and sticking angels on people, but maybe. <laughs> um, so this literature still survives in Judaism down to this day, written many, many centuries ago in the Middle Ages, still reprinted till, till this day. Uh, the Charba de Moshe is not reprinted anymore, but it's still, you can buy an academic copy of it and hack into reality if you, so, if you like. Um, the Sword of Moses. 
the most important, the most I would say the most important magical manual, and it's a copy of it that actually came up to, to purchase at Sotheby's uh, not too uh, long ago, is a text called The Goal of the Rise. This is an Islamic book of magic referred to as the Picatrix. This is a system of astral magic. Astral magic, like we saw back in Alkindi, right? We're using the power of the, the radiation of the planets to summon various kinds of creatures. This gets much more systematized in a text called the Picatrix. This text is completely preserved both in Arabic and in a Latin translation, which I'll talk more about in just a moment. This contains the greatest systematic collection of occult knowledge of the basically the classical world, the late classical world. It synthesizes three really important sections of magic and the occult practices of the Islamic world. One is the collection of alchemical lore by a guy named, or a circle of people named Jabir ibn Hayyan. Um, if you've ever heard of the word algebra, right? Um, you can blame him. Um, find X. Um, if you start having you know, flashbacks, then you can blame. Uh, so algebra was developed in this circle as well. Mathematical, mathematics and magic are actually share a very common ancestry. It's only in the 19th century they go their separate ways, actually. Mathematics and magic were linked together up until the 19th century. Jabir ibn Hayyan was also an alchemist. Actually, he wasn't a real person. He was a group of people who wrote under one name. But he wrote about alchemy, and he wrote about math, and he wrote about magic. So it also contains a, a group of people called the Brethren of Purity. This was a uh, occult brotherhood of Muslims living in Baghdad, which, by the way, had the largest library in the world until it was destroyed by the Mongols, which Mongols do that kind of thing. Uh, it was destroyed in 1258. Uh, by the way, it had four times the amount of books that the Library of Alexandria had, if you want a sense of how much was lost. Four times as much. People, pay, people talk a big game about the uh, Library of Alexandria. The Beit al-Hikmah had four times the books. 400,000 volumes were saved. Imagine what was lost. Right? 400,000 volumes were saved. Uh, that's not counting all the ones that were lost. In fact, it said that the Tigris River ran black because of all the ink that was thrown into, uh, into the river. So a huge loss for humanity. The Brethren of Purity were some of the founding members of that library, probably some of the most educated people in the history of the world in terms of what they had access to. The Brethren of Purity produced an enormous output of literature, most of it still in manuscript, but the, it was sort of systematized in The Goal of the Wise. Another book is uh, Ibn Washiyah's Nabataean Agriculture. Now, I know a book about agriculture doesn't sound spooky. It's like farming. What you actually have in the Nabataean agriculture was all of the collected knowledge of the pre-Islamic pagan civilizations. When Islam came through Arabia, there were pagans living there. And the pagans had literature, they had art, they had magic, they had science, they had all kinds of things. And what ended up happening was, as Islam destroyed a lot of that or assimilated it, this book, Ibn Mashiach's Nabataean Agriculture, was the last attempt by a Muslim as a kind of ethnographer to go among the very last pagans in Iraq and try to extract as much information as they could before they went extinct, and extinct they went. The Nabataean Agriculture is an enormous book, nine volumes long. Less than a fifth of it is translated to English at this point. It is a huge collection of what we know about the ancient Arab pagans of that region, and the Nabataean agriculture collects it. If you're wondering why it's agriculture, it's because they lived in the one place in Baghdad where you could grow stuff. Um, and so they were really agricultural geniuses, and, um, and uh, they had their own form of uh, Islamic, uh, pre-Islamic paganism, and it survives only there. The Picatrix gathers all of them into one book. The Picatrix gathers them all into one book. My good friend of mine helped to translate it, uh, who just finished his dissertation. Um, and so you can find a translation of the Latin edition. An Arabic uh, translation of the Arabic edition is forthcoming soon. So finally, we'll actually have an actual translation of the original Arabic edition as well. This text is going to become the guiding stone in the development of magic in the Western world. See these images again? Little dots? That's, this manuscript is from about 1300. Right? The magic of 1300. This is about a thousand years after we first saw them. These magical symbols have survived all the way into Western Europe at this point. By the 12th and 13th centuries, we undergo the Renaissance. Now, I know we're in an art institute, so I have to be careful about what I say, but that whole 15th century French or Italian Renaissance that you've heard about, <laughs> whatever. The real Renaissance, folks, is the 13th and 12th century Renaissance. That was the real Renaissance. Why? Because that is where we have all of the knowledge of the ancient and classical world, right? What was available, translated into Latin and entering Europe. 
Alchemy enters Europe on February the 11th, 1111. It's easy to remember, 1111. Magic enters in the 13th century. We know the dates in which these things get translated because the translators are very fastidious in terms of their translation skills. We can date when these texts are entering Europe via the Arab world in Spain, across the Pyrenees, into France. This is a copy or a page of the Picatrix translated into Latin. We have now entered Western Europe. The magical traditions of Western Europe are going to be bombarded from the Arab world and then from the Christian world from Byzantium. And what we're going to see is a tidal wave of occult works, alchemy, astrology, heterodox philosophy, occult sciences, magic. They're going to flood into Europe. They're going to flood into Europe at a rate that the religious institutions not only can't control, but if you can't beat them, join them. What is going to happen is, guess who's literate in Latin at this time? Guess who knows magical? Guess who knows how to do rituals at this time? Guess who knows how to get access to books at this time? Yeah. Guess who's going to be leading the way in terms of the production and practice of magic through the European Middle Ages? The church. In an organization or a cluster of organization we call the clerical necromantic underground. The only people that can do this are going to be priests. Now, they're not going to be the good guy priests. They're going to be the kind of priests that fly by night, right? And it's going to be the clerical necromantic underground, which needs to be like a black metal band. Um, it's going to be the clerical necromantic underground that is going to inaugurate magic into Europe. I know you think of the Inquisition as burning the books, but the very guys burning the books by day are studying them by night. And I guarantee you, go into the libraries of the Vatican and in the church libraries of Europe, they did not burn those books. They stored them as evidence, and they read them, and they practiced them, and they copied them, and they disseminated them. Come back next week, I'll bring some of them. I will literally have some books from the 16th, 17th century with me that are books of magic, and you can thumb through them if you're careful, and we will begin looking at these books and seeing how magic is going to continue to evolve. The magical book will be here to stay in Europe all the way down till now. Thank you.